Good morning, everyone. Sunday, September 6, 2020. Time for episode 33 of Kerr's Rage, part one of the Twar Heem Staff Saga. By me. And we're going to start off today on page 347. We're getting close to the end of the book. And the party has been examining a suit of mysterious armor while Kalor is reading the dragon's book. Okay. But Kalor was still reading through the dragon's works with the intense curiosity that only a gnome possess. His spell of reading filtered and reassembled Modril's script into words and patterns that he could understand. The only thing that he lacked was the ability to actually think like a dragon. He could attempt to cast great, the Great Worm spells using the spell book, but he didn't think that he would ever be able to commit the alien patterns to his own memory like his own incantations. Modrul's magical formula were far too complex, and only his spell was allowing him to see the intricate patterns in a manner that he could under comprehend. He recognized several spells that were similar to ones that he knew. One would cast a great bolt of energy that would do terrible damage to its target. Another would call down the power of lightning, and still another could lower or part waters in a large area. Many, many of the other spells had purposes that he could only guess at. These would take further and prolonged study. As for the book... Even though it was three feet wide, he intended to carry it with him until he and Dao had mastered it. Sometime later, they all gathered around the campfire. They were all grateful to be dry again. Tarek had discovered that the guano could be cut into blocks that burned readily and hot. Its fire quickly rid them of any lingering cold that they felt. They talked about what they'd found. Before them lay half of an amazing suit of armor, some dwarven gold, a dragon spellbook, and fortunately, a brief respite from constant travel and fighting. Dal and Karina spoke of all that had happened to them while they were apart. The orcs, she said, had had their way with all the human women, but left her and others of her ilk alone. Why this was, she didn't know, but she feared some more frightening end to her Lyo Selfar companions. We should rest for the night, Common said. The sun's going down. And it's going to be pitch black in here soon. We should set a watch by the cave mouth, Tarek said. Two man shifts, just in case. I'll take first watch, Kerr said. My mind is racing, and I won't be able to sleep for a long time. What worries you? I can't help thinking that this might have been the dragon that burned the halls of Dwarvencrest and stole Baldric's hoard. I'll take watch with you, Leander said, and you can tell me the story. They watched long into the night and didn't wake, and didn't wake a relief until it was nearly dawn. Morning came, and the storm had not abated. Outside, nothing stirred but the snow. Kalor stayed awake most of the night, pouring his thought into learning the secrets of the book. He had learned the secrets behind many of the spells, understanding their complex formulas, but many of them still eluded him. If he tried to invoke their unknown powers, he could inadvertently cause some tragedy. But with diligent curiosity, he accomplished much of his goal. He became so oblivious to the outside world that when Dao approached him in the early morning hours, he jumped with a start. How's it going? Dao, try not to sneak up on me like that. I made more noise than a drunken tavern dwarf, but both of them knew that he always moved with the silent grace of the Lyle Selfar. Every step that he took was fluidly controlled by well-coordinated muscles. Mudrul had many spells similar to our own, but on a much grander scale, such as, Dao said with great interest, his magical formula are complex and vastly powerful. We can cast them from this book, but I doubt that we could ever commit them to memory. May I have a look? Of course. Perhaps you can teach me your reading spell, so that I won't misinterpret any of Mudrul's magic. Kalor taught him the simple spell, and he learned it very quickly. I remember now. My father taught it to me when I was a student. Together, they pooled their knowledge and training. By morning's end, they had determined the effects of most of Modrul's magic. But it was as Kalor had guessed. 
The dragon spells were beyond the capacity of their mortal minds and could only be cast by reading the book itself. The Sulphurous Pool When Darton and Leander <clears throat> were on guard, Carmen, Kerr, Karina, and Tarek prepared to explore the pool. It was vast and dark, with bubbling fumes occasionally bursting from the surface of the water. Above them, some hidden source was cascading water down the spiny stalactites and into the water in an eerie symphony of blips and bloops. Within the pond, stalagmites rose up out of the water in places. Sulfur deposits coated them with a sickly yellow residue. The murky waters prevented them from viewing the bottom beyond a depth of one or two feet, and the unmoving water showed no signs of life except for the dripping and bubbling waters. Carmen decided that it was time for them to explore its depths. I'll go in first, Tarek said, realizing her intentions. No, I'll go. I need the strength of those on shore behind my safety line. Besides, I'm a good swimmer. I'd rather not go in too deep, Kerr said. Dwarves sink. And neither Carmen nor Tara could help laughing at such a matter-of-fact comment. Going to work, they secured one end of a long mountaineering rope to a large stalagmite on the cabin floor. Carmen removed her arms and armor and left only her leather pants and under tunic on to protect her from any jagged rocks. The only weapon that she carried was her dirk, which she kept sheathed at her waist. Around herself, she fastened the rope and with uncertain, testing steps, she entered the pool. <clears throat> Karina passed her a lit torch once she was in the water and then reluctantly, she turned and worked her way toward the center. The muddy bottom clung stubbornly to her boots, and each step was a struggle against the weight of her feet. But beneath the mud was stone, and she was able to plod steadily forward. Nearing the middle, her torchlight occasionally caught bright flashes in the water, but when she looked more closely, her eyes and hands found nothing but water and mud. Confused and chest deep in the water, she planted her torch in the crevice of a jutting stone and decided to risk a dive. The minerals in the water stung her eyes, but the effect soon eased and she became used to it. She could make out vague shapes ahead of her as she swam onward, and swimming deeper, she spied a great pile of debris. To her horror, they were the bones of men. Staring at her through vacant eye sockets were the skulls of hundreds of Modrul's victims and what remained of their skeletons. Terrified, she swam frantically for the surface. It was then that she suddenly realized that she was not alone. She's been down a long time, Kerr said. Give her a few seconds more, Tarek said, although he could scarcely hide his concern for the invisible paladin. But Carmen had greater troubles. Swimming around her were many long, eel-like serpents, eyeing her with lifeless black eyes. One immense serpent swam by her face for what seemed an eternity. My God, she thought, how long can it possibly be? Kicking for all that she was worth, she burst gasping from the surface. Pull me out, she screamed, and Kerr and Tarek labored to meet the task, with Karina doing her best to take up the slack. Their mighty efforts were fast, but they couldn't match the deadly speed of the pool's predatory inhabitants. With a hunger born from decades of surviving on what accidentally found its way into their cavern pool, the eels attacked her. One of them clamped onto her leg and strove to shake a piece off of her. Its fearsome jaws held her fast as it twisted her about in frantic circles. But she was a fighter first and foremost, and somehow she was able to draw her dirk and hack desperately at the eel's head. With every stab, she prayed that it would release her, but its bony jaws never loosened. Between her companion's irresistible pull and the eel's tearing teeth, she was slowly being torn apart. Their blood dispersed, sending the other serpents into a frenzy, many of them tearing chunks from each other as well as from the eel that grasped her leg. Without her trousers and tunic, she would have been devoured, but all the, although the eel's teeth were razor sharp, they were short, and most of them penetrated only a short distance into her flesh. Thus far, her leather pants were holding. 
Hacking furiously at the eel's head finally made it give way, and she was pulled into the shallow waters of the pool where the eels didn't follow. She struggled to hold on to her safety line. Her wounds stung terribly. She could feel her pants legs slapping against her calf, but nothing beneath it. She wasn't even sure if her foot was still attached. This was, uh, that sentence was inspired by, uh, a static line injury I incurred while I was a ranger in 3rd Ranger Battalion. Um, while leaving the aircraft one night, my the safety, who takes your static line away from your body as you leave the aircraft, uh, accidentally misrouted my static line under my arm. So when I went out the door, the static line, now attached to the aircraft to the cable, and then under my arm back to my parachute, uh, so my arm had to go, so it crushed through my bicep, dislocated my shoulder, and then I ended up upside down in a tangled parachute, uh, crashing to earth. But luckily I was able to untangle myself, and then I ended up landing in the trees next to the Chattahoochee River um, at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, upside down. <laughs> um, I reached back, it was pitch dark behind my head and I felt the ground beneath me and I had just I had fallen all the way through the tree to about seven feet where my foot had caught in the crook of the tree and I fell upside down but I was right near the ground so I was able to kick my leg loose and fall the rest of the way down <clears throat> then uh, my right arm was worthless it hurt uh, at that point I started to feel the pain <clears throat> And my, my parachute was inextricably uh, captured in the limbs of the tree above me in the dark. So I couldn't retrieve it. So I went back to the drop zone as best I could, carrying what equipment I could. And I found another injured ranger on the ground there who had suffered a back injury. And he was screaming um, in terrible pain because... Um, the injury to his back had caused his hamstrings of his legs to go into a violent contraction. And he was just an unbelievable pain, worse than I was in. And I, supposedly the medics were coming to pick him up. So I said, oh, I'll wait here. Well, four hours later, while listening to my comrade scream in pain, trying to help him with one arm, I finally was brought back to the hospital and... Uh, I was scolded by my superiors for leaving my parachute in the forest. My right arm was as big as a football at that point, just filled with blood. And, uh, well, it caused me to have somewhat of a handicap for the rest of my life. But anyway, that's what um, inspired that particular line in that particular paragraph. Okay, I'll go back a little. <clears throat> uh, hacking furiously at the eels. But, oh, but anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh... When, when the injury occurred and I was still in the air, I couldn't feel my arm from the shoulder down. But I could feel something slapping against my calf of my leg. So I thought that my arm had actually been chopped off completely. And that it was still inside of my BDU sleeve of my shirt. And was thereby um, bouncing against my body. So that, that's why I uh, included that in this paragraph. <clears throat> uh, anyway, going back. Hacking furiously at the eel's head, finally made it give way, and she was pulled into the shallow waters of the pool where the eels didn't follow. She struggled to hold on to her safety line. Her wounds stung terribly. She could feel her pants legs slapping against her calf, but nothing beneath it. She wasn't even sure if her foot was still attached. It was a long fight for the shore of the deadly pool, and she could do nothing but hang on and be dragged. It seemed like an eternity. When she finally felt the firm ground beneath her, she let out a long sigh of relief. She had nearly been fish food. She was lucky. Somehow her injuries weren't as serious as they were bloody. Her pants and boot had taken the brunt of the first eel's bite. And her other injuries were mostly puncture wounds that bled freely. By the time Tara could cut away her torn clothing, Dartin had reached them. Karina told me to hurry. What happened? She got chomped by some big fish, Kerr said. He examined her injuries. It looks like they were very big. 
Can you do any healing yet? Carmen asked. It hurts bad. It hurt. It burns. Probably the sulfur. Kerr, bring me some fresh water. Don't worry. I've had time to rest. After washing away the filth of the pool, he closed his eyes and called upon the power of the runes, and soon Carmen's great hurts were his. Her cuts bled again from his body, and finally, with a wave of relief, his own wounds were taken by Odin. Carmen collapsed with relief, lying on the cool stone of the cavern floor, reveling in her ability to breathe freely and without pain. It was good to be whole and safe among friends. She smiled up at Dartin, but he'd collapsed again. Apparently, he hadn't rested enough. <clears throat> take cover, Tarek. Oh, take over, Tarek, sorry. <laughs> Leander and I will carry Dartin back to bed. Sitting by the fire, she stared into the blue flames and tried to forget the horrible eels. Tarek stood on the shore deep in thought and Kerr beside him. Karina stood by wondering what was on their minds. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Carmen's torch still burned atop that outlying rock, illuminating the surface of the churning water. I'm thinking that we should go fishing. I'll get some rope and a grappling hook, and I'll fetch some of that ox meat out of my pack. Then after some preparation, they fastened the long rope to a sizable stalactite, stalagmite and tied Tarek's sharp grappling hook to its end like an enormous fish hook. Kerr placed a large chunk of bait onto the hook, and soon their makeshift fishing line was complete and in the deep water. Karina watched their enthusiastic preparations, shaking her head at their boyish excitement. Here was a fishing trip of epic proportions. Seconds later, the line was torn from Tarek's waiting grasp. Racing out, the slack of the rope was quickly gone, and the great force of the eel's rush set the hook with a violent impact that nearly snapped the rope. The thrashing that then ensued rivaled the eel's previous feeding frenzy, bringing the waters to a boil in the fish's attempt to shake the troublesome barb from its mouth. The eel strove to escape, but though it twisted and thrashed wildly, it was unable to free itself. When the line grew less frenzied, they braced their feet well and began to draw in the huge fish. When its great girth reached the shallows, it fought hard against them, and their backs bent with the strain. They never relented, and soon the floundering fish was near shore. Seeing its end, the eel opened its mouth wide and hissed horribly, revealing its needle-sharp teeth. Okay, Kerr, Tarek said. Do you have any idea what we do with it now that it's caught? Let's drag it ashore, and Karina can bash it with her sword. Oh no, I'm not getting anywhere near that thing. We've got to get them all out, Kerr said, straining against the rope, to get to the treasure. All right, but you owe me, dwarf. Together they dragged the huge creature ashore, and verily it was over twelve feet in length. Fighting for every inch of ground, they finally beached the eel. In the blink of an eye, Karina rushed in to chop at its neck, but the fish's body was slimy and thick with muscle, and she was taking off her feet by its thrashing body. Tarek and Kerr could do nothing, but hold on and hope that she could finish it. Her pride was hurt when she fell so awkwardly on her backside, and when she rose, she sank her sword deeply into the eel's throat. With two hands, she worked the blade towards its brain. Its thrashing soon ceased. Well done, Kerr said. An axe couldn't have done it better. But she was not amused, especially with the great quantity of eel slime on her pants leg. Let's get on with it. I'm beginning to lose my patience with these fish. They all laughed at that, and Tarek might have teased her, but he quickly thought better of it. Better to leave her mad at the fish than mad at them. In an hour's time, they'd caught seven fish, and they were all thoroughly soaked, ranging in length from eight to nearly sixteen feet. The eel's bodies were thicker in girth than a man's. Despite their catch, there still seemed to be no end to the mindless predators. Tired and weary, they scanned the pool. Finding the telltale swirls of several more eels, they wished that there was an easier way of catching them. While the trio fished, Kalor and Dao studied the dragon's book with renewed intensity. In fact, Dao had translated a spell that Kalor had found trouble with, and he knew it to be the incantation used by Modrul to uncover his treasure. I have it, Kalor, Dao said. With this spell, 
I can drain the pool's water and reveal the hidden treasure. Odril's magic could be dangerous and unpredictable. I don't think that we're ready. Nonsense, Dow said. I understand your fears, but we'll never know if we don't try to use it. But it's been years, Kalor said, since you've casted a simple cantrip or even a divination. I should do it. If something goes wrong, then I may need you to rescue me. Fear not, Kalor, for as Carmen said, we must try. It seemed to Kalor that the warrior mage had found himself again. Darton was standing watch as everyone else gathered around the pool to see Dal cast a spell. Placing the book on a large flat rock near the water's edge, Kalor held a torch aloft so that Dal could see the dragon's runes. Stand back, he said, for this spell is very powerful. And when Dal began to chant the first words of the incantation, the book began to glow a fierce red, rising to stand open before him as if it rested upon some invisible podium of air. A strange countenance seemed to overtake him, and when he spoke, he spoke with the voice of Modrul. Water of life, flow through stone, over earth and into sand, flow down deeper still, flow down into the sea and leave my pool for the air. Ten times breathed, breath of frost dragon, breath of air, expose my treasures most fair, down deep beneath the sulphurous waves of Modrul's lair. With the last words spoken, the pool bubbled and hissed, and its water somehow fell down into the earth, draining down to none knew where. And before them all, a great mound was revealed, or more closely, a heap, for surely it appeared as little more than a mound of bones, rusted arms, and armor. Behold, all of my enemy knaves, the Ender said, fallen to naught beneath my claws and fangs. For there lies that which I saved, Carvin said. Then we found it, Kerr said, crestfallen. Nothing but a pile of bones and rust. I think that you speak too soon, Kayla said. If I were a dragon, I might hide my treasure under just such a pile. <clears throat> Kerr's eyes lit up like aquamarine gemstones at the thought of it. Well, let's find out. Wading in, he could barely contain his excitement. Plodding through the mud, he drew forth corn cloth and dispatched any thrashing eels that came too near to him. They flapped all about the muddy basin, over twenty more in all. Finally reaching the pile, he stared, started pulling away the muck and rusted debris with great heaving movements, and lo, something gleamed within. Kalor, there's something here! And then most surely the gold fever was upon him, and he instantly forgot all his previous fatigue. In a few moments, the rest of them were by his side, helping him to uncover the buried treasure. All of them were caught up in the excitement. Soon they were all covered in the eel's black muck and no less the smell. But despite all of this, they revealed several interesting items. Four great chests that were too heavy to lift rested near the center of the pile, and around them were several objects that showed no signs of corrosion. Among them were a great helm, a fine round shield, in the lower half of the same night that had been eaten by Modrul. Beneath all these were the rotted husks of ancient sacks which disintegrated with the slightest touch. Each of the bags had been filled to capacity with coins of all kinds. Gold, silver, and platinum were all represented in abundance. It was a treasure beyond their wildest dreams. We're rich, Kerr said. I can build my fortress and fill it with a thousand dwarves. What good will all of this do us now, Keg Carmen said. We can only carry some small amount with us. We can use the horses to haul it home. We have the quest to consider. What of the quest? With all this gold, we need no quest. You don't know what you're saying. He's got the fever, Karina said. Nothing do, to do but to wait for it to pass. Usually takes dwarves about a hundred years or so. We haven't got that long. Let him have it, Leander suggested. He's doing the work of ten men with that unquenchable fire within him. But Kerr only continued his efforts, scowling and grumbling unintelligible things to word off their comments. Yet of them all, Leander knew Kerr's heart the best, and he knew full well how to break the gold spell, but for now it only served to fuel his amazing endurance. Two days of hard work were needed to sift through the debris and carry all the objects to high ground. 
Kalor sprung the encrusted locks from the chests and found the greatest part of the treasure. In one chest lay an amazing sword. It was a scimitar in a golden sheath. Its handle was of intricately carved ivory, and a fine diamond gem of incredible size crowned its hilt. It was the most exquisite weapon that Kalor had ever seen, and when he reached for it, he received a tremendous shock that blew him back several feet and into the waiting arms of a surprised Tarek. His short beard and curly hair stood straight out in a comical manner, and for a long time he lay dazed and delirious in his outstretched arms. But the end I felt a strange calling from the sword, and some faint whisper told him that he'd not be harmed. How he knew this he could not explain, but unlike Kalor, when he grasped the scabbard he was not jolted, and in fact the sword did speak to him. I am a Trandoru, Stormbringer, wield me well, warrior priest of Arundel. Dropping the weapon in surprise, he asked, Did anyone else hear that? We heard nothing, Carmen said. Are you all right? I, I'm fine. The sword, it spoke to me. I've heard of sentient swords in my studies, Dao said, although only a few have been known throughout history. Sentient? Tarek asked. Yes, they are swords magically imbued with intelligent minds and special powers, even purposes all of their own. How could that be? It's an ancient magic, but to wield such a blade is perilous for those who are weak-willed. What should I do? Leander said. Leander asked. It's your decision. The sword seems to have singled you out from all the rest of us. It could hold tremendous power for good or for ill. But as long as I've known you, you've never been a man of weak will or evil intent. If the sword was dark-natured, it would not have chosen you. Reassured by Dao's uncharacteristic praise, he realized that his Lao Selfar friend had changed much in only a few days. With newfound confidence, he took up the wonderful scimitar and drew forth its blade, and lo, a great thunderclap issued forth, and all of them jumped in surprise. In a rush, Atran Daru's powers became known to him. With the magnificent blade in his hand, he could summon the storm, and all of its powers would be his. That's where we'll leave off, episode 33 at the top of page 358. We'll begin episode 34 next time. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed my story. And as always, read Curse Rage, part one of the Dwarf Heemstaff saga, and all of the following novels by me. Thank you, and have a great night.